Hello guys, I'm back. It's been about over a month, I want to say, since I last posted my last video. And I'm going to tell you why. I've been gone for so long, actually. And it's because I have got really sick ever since I last posted my video. And all the symptoms I had were body aches, vomiting, um... Uh, loss of appetite I would get cold so I would get chills I would get really cold shivering and as soon as my shivering episodes would be over I'd sweat profusely like insanely I had a very sharp pain on my left um, abdomen like abdominal pain on the left side um, and it affected the way I would go restroom so I actually had a lot of diarrhea okay so I had a lot of symptoms that weren't really the best um, and I try to hold it off I would take painkillers I would feel better with the painkiller so I didn't really think much of it I thought maybe at first maybe it was food poisoning um, and then at se second I, maybe I just got you know, a stomach flu or something. I, and so I kind of pushed it off for three weeks. Yeah, three weeks. It's a long time to be feeling that way. <sighs> Basically, well, I ended up losing about 15 pounds within those three weeks because of all the vomiting, all, all the things I'm losing. I'm, I'm losing from my mouth, from the bottom, and I'm not really eating because of my la loss of appetite and because of that I lost 15 pounds I should have gone to the hospital sooner much sooner uh, but I didn't because I was being very stubborn after three weeks there was a moment where I was babysitting my nephew and um, his dad came home his brother my brother-in-law and he took over and I kind of fell asleep on the couch and I was shivering and I was extremely cold and I had blankets on me and even then I was still really really extremely cold I moved over to my bed and I fell asleep for a bit my sister came home and I had promised her I was gonna cook dinner but I was just feeling the worst the worst that day and so when she came home and she tried to wake me up I didn't I didn't make a move to get up and I just try to s stay sleeping and basically one thing led to another my sister said a few things I tried to say a few things and she she was worried about me everyone here was worried about me even back home because they knew my symptoms and they knew what I was going like what I was experiencing and everyone was pushing me to go to the hospital and in the end I was still trying to hold it off. I don't know why, okay? I was still trying to hold it off and I ended up drinking a bit of water. I hadn't eaten all day. I ate like around, I tried to eat pancakes. It didn't go well with me. I took like one or two bites. Did not, uh -uh. drank a ton of water after that. Um, and then I ate like about three saltine crackers. You know, those little squares, just about three of those. I was trying to slowly eat some because I found that that was the only thing that I was actually able to digest and keep down without feeling too nauseous. Even then, like, I'll take a few bites and I could only take small bites because if I take regular bites, I wanted to, like, just throw up, basically. I was able to get off of, out of bed. was still feeling bad, but it was more towards the part where I was sweating profusely and I got up out of bed. And I went to the living room and I drank water. And as soon as I drank water, I gagged. I gagged a big, like just a really big one. And that made me want to run to the restroom to throw up. I ran to the restroom. I ended up throwing up the water I just drank. And basically the three little crackers I ate earlier in the day. And then everything else coming after was yellow fluid that was extremely extremely nasty this tasted terrible and at the same time 
while I was throwing up, I got a nosebleed from both nose, from both nostrils. One nose, I have one nose. <laughs> from both nostrils, I ended up bleeding out. And at the same time, my my vomit, what I was projectiling, was so strong. I, as embarrassing as it is, but I want to let everything out there so you guys are aware. But um, as I was throwing up, and it was such a great force that I couldn't stop. I couldn't help but, but pee, basically. It was, it was embarrassing. Um, but it happened. I ended up peeing all over myself. And it wouldn't stop. Every single time I threw up, more came out. More blood came out. And it was more yellow fluid coming out of my, my stomach. And from there... My sister originally was going to take me to urgent care, but after seeing what I was going, what I was doing, basically, we went to the emergency room. I was able to change. We rushed out to the emergency room. I got in. I told the front desk my, I checked in basically and all everything I was feeling and experiencing. And she goes, okay, well, you can sit down and we'll call your name once you know they're ready to co- to see you and as soon as I turn around to walk away they call me to the back and they're like okay come on let's go back we need to check out what's going on and they took me to the back they test me for a ton of things um they they asked for my symptoms again when it was starting and all and they gave me Tylenol I believe or I forgot if it was Tylenol or Advil, but they gave me painkillers because I told them that I typically would get abdominal pain on the left side. Sometimes I'll expand towards the right. And a lot of the times when I will go to the restroom throughout that three weeks, it did hurt. And there was once where it was very painful. That left side of my stomach would hurt when I would try to go to the restroom. So I told them that, and I told them that I'm not experiencing any pains, but I typically take painkillers when I start feeling sick, because it helps out a lot. And they gave me, they gave me painkillers, and then they tested me for all these other things, like um, diabetes at that point, they they scanned my heart, but I was so sweaty because of the symptoms I was experiencing since I got there. I was just sweating and sweating and sweating, that all this tape they try to stick on me for the heart monitor wouldn't stick and they try to they try to test and test but it wouldn't stick so they ended up taking me to the back um I lay down on the bed and they hooked me up because turned out I was extremely extremely dehydrated so within the three weeks I kept losing and losing body fluids I kept losing and I wasn't able to replenish that as much as I tried I wasn't able to replenish that and I was just extremely thirsty, extremely like dehydrated. So they had to do, they had to connect me, they had put IVs on me and they were hydrating me up. Three weeks of dehydration basically. And that made me want to go to the restroom a lot. Um, Cause suddenly out of three weeks, I finally start getting fluids in me. And so I made me want to go to the restroom a lot. So I had to call the nurse a lot. And they'd have to unhook me. I'd have to go to the restroom and then come back. They'll hook me back up. And then that day, we were in the waiting room. They tested me for COVID, strep throat. They took blood out a couple times. And I was taken to a CAT scan. And I was tested for diabetes. And I was tested for quite a few things because they couldn't really figure out at first what was going on with me. And why I was experiencing what I was experiencing. And quite a few nurses came in. Quite a few doctors came in to ask my my symptoms. And and to get further detail basically of what was going on with me. And in the end, they told me that I would have to get admitted. And that scared me because I've never been admitted to the hospital. I mean, I know people who have. My sister has been one of them. My sister has been one of those who have been admitted. My uncle has been admitted to the hospital but I don't really know much else of who that I know of has been admitted to the hospital and I always I it's literally I have no reason to but I always had a fear of doctors and I'm sure a lot of people do like they have a fear of hospitals of doctors 
And I think that's one of the main reasons why I waited three weeks to get there. But um, they told me I was going to get admitted because my symptoms were pretty bad. And they ended up figuring out what was wrong with me. I had what is called an abscess on my colon and it had ruptured. So it was very, very, very dangerous for anything like that to rupture an abscess in your anywhere in your body to rupture because all that fluid then goes all over the place and they would have to do emergency surgery to clean it out and hopefully remove that bad part that ruptured or you know disinfect it and clean it out and whatnot um so my abscess had ruptured and i had to stay overnight and one of the doctors that came in to see me was discussing that i would have surgery the next day or i will have possibly just a catheter bag inputted into me and it really like scared me not gonna lie i couldn't sleep that night they they took me up to the the care unit whatever where patients stay and get checked on by nurses. The first two nights, I was checked on quite a lot by the nurses. They came in to check my vitals. They they gave me um, a hydration. I forgot what it is. What's exactly called? Um, amoxicillin because I needed antibiotics I was getting quite a bit of fluids in me and I had potassium I believe I forgot what it was I think it was potassium because I was really low on it and they inputted that all into me um the first night when they were putting in the potassium I think the nurse got confused because she was putting straight potassium into me and as it was going in, it burned. My arm, the RV, IV was in, was burning so bad. Like, it started as a small burn, but it grew, it grew, and it grew. And I was just like, nurse, this hurts so bad. And she had to stop the fluids from going in. And then she, at first thought maybe the IV went bad. So she gave me a second IV on this arm. Like, you can still see the little hole. Because <laughs> the first one was here right there and she was confused because she was like well that's a good IV so I don't understand why it's happening so she put it made a new IV and she started putting it and at first it was fine but before she left it started really 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 burning again like it just grew the pain so I had to tell her again and she was like okay I'm gonna stop it and I'm gonna go basically figure out what she was supposed to do she came back not too long after and then they told her that she would have to dilute the potassium with the other liquids they were putting in me and the line still had straight potassium so she was like we're gonna clear that out and then we're it's gonna start but it was still connected to me so when she was trying to clear it out it was still really burning so when i told her it hurt she disconnected it she dripped it into a glove and then once it was finished she finally reconnected it and it, oh my god it was such a relief it was so much better um i barely slept anything that night edith my sister was very awesome to be with me the entire time and stay with me and she even took the day off the next day because she had work so she wasn't gonna stay in the hospital with me that night but because of how scared I was and how nervous I was, she ended up taking the day off the next day and she stayed with me in the hospital and she was there with me and it was very helpful, honestly. The next day, very early in the morning, maybe six in the morning, they came to draw more blood and very constantly had my vitals checked. I had to keep going to the restroom throughout the whole night. I would have to call the nurse, you know, you know, depending on the nurse some of them would disconnect my ivs completely and i'd be able to freely go to the restroom or the nurse would just disconnect and i would have to drag a pole with the iv bags on top like those bags they were through my iv line and i'll have to push that all the way into the restroom so the nurses would have to wait in the room and wait for me to be done so that they could help me put it back and whatnot i was there for just i think three four days i can't remember exactly it's all been it's all been so fast, honestly, everything that's happened. 
Um, that same night, I got my heart checked again. And they put a bunch of pasties all over. And they put clipped them on. And they checked my heart monitor. Now that I was not as sweaty, basically. Because I was sweating and sweating and sweating. <laughs> One of the nurses, because I stood up to go restroom. She was like, oh my god, you made, you made a sweat angel on my bed. So they had to change the sheets and whatnot. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, but yeah, I was in the hospital. And on the next day, the doctor explained to me exactly what had happened and basically diagnosed me with the disease that I've never ever ever heard about in my entire life and I've never heard of anyone that I know having it um it's called diverticulitis and honestly when the doctor told me the first time and he had left the room I had asked because my sister and my brother-in-law were in the room and I had asked them, wait, what was it that he said? What was it that he said I had? And they had to repeat what it was. I was confused. I was just like, that's, what, what is that? And, but he basically explained it. It's, um, basically, typically happens to much older people, like, 40, 50 and on. It can happen to younger people, but it's really rare. Um, not as common. It's typically more the older people since their immune system gets weaker over time. They're more susceptible to more diseases. And I remember how they kept everyone in the hospital that would check and whatnot would talk to me about my situation would all tell me, you're so young. You're just very young to be having this. And they were all concerned. Basically... The reason why they didn't rush me to surgery right the night before I arrived was because, yes, my abscess ex um, exploded, right? It started leaking out the liquids. And yes, technically, it should have gone over my, my, my insides and I should have had emergency surgery. But my immune system, to an extent, is very healthy that once it exploded it did a safety reaction basically so my colon ended up forming a a pouch a wall a uh, a wall around the fluids to keep it from from spreading all over and that doctor said i was very lucky to have that happen um so basically well he explained a couple more things and I wasn't given anything to eat the first night I was there and then half of the second night because they still weren't sure whether I was going to have surgery or I was going to have the catheter bag inserted. Um, and then doctor explained that the catheter bag will basically they'll numb me. Yes, I'll feel a bit of a burning sensation, but then that's it. I'll just feel pressure. The bag is in and then that's it. I was like, okay, well, it doesn't sound too bad. I can deal with the numbing. I mean, I've had pain, really bad pain for three weeks already. I, I think I can deal with a little bit of numbing. I've had needles stuck into me all day <laughs> that day and all morning. So I'm pretty sure I can deal with a little bit of a numb, right? So they finally come and get me and they start rolling me out because they travel with the bed. They don't have you get stand up. They don't have you walk. They don't have you go in a wheelchair. They push you around in the bed. And they take me all the way to radiology um, and I got transferred over to a skinnier bed and then they did their, their CAT scan machine or their x-ray machine was down. So the doctor said that if he couldn't find it with, with the ultrasound basically, then I would have to be transferred to hospitals, which would not have been ideal. Um, but luckily for me, they were able to find it with the ultrasound. They put the gel, they put the machine, they went and they connected. They told me it was, um, I forgot what it was that they said it was, but basically it was to relax me. And some people fall asleep, some don't, but there was no promise. And they were putting some in and then they started working. And oh, let me tell you. There was not just a little burning sensation. Um, I think they changed how they do things because they didn't poke me at all to numb me. They went straight to 
may I don't know honestly I didn't want to look but I'm assuming the needle was really long because and somewhat thick because they have to see they have to drain some in their in their tubes to see if that is the correct or to see how the liquid is basically inside and oh my gosh it was painful to tell to say the least like after the ex I mean like I want to say luckily it was a short a short procedure right I was expecting for it to be much longer but they were fairly quickly with ev very quick with everything and um next thing I know after all that pain I feel there I have a tube in me it was a very small tube but I have a tube in me and I have a bag for leakage and I'm done it's all done but I was so nervous I didn't cry okay I didn't cry I wasn't crying on the table like ooh. but right after they were done I don't know why my breathing went like that but you know when you cry for so long and then you're, you're trying to stop so your breathing kind of goes like <laughs> um, that's what I was doing and the nurse was a bit like why wh why are you breathing like that and I was just like I don't know I think I was just way too nervous but I'm just trying to control my breathing and they're like okay and I asked another nurse because I guess she was putting on bandages and whatnot and I was like oh is it over she goes yeah it's over so I got transferred back to my other bed and then they put me to the side like they took me out of the radiology room and then the nurse that was there was just like keep an eye on your bag <laughs> know where your bag is at all times because if it gets yanked out or you yank it out you're gonna have to come back here and we're gonna have to do that procedure again to re-put that bag in there and I said I guess I was just going through it right there. I said, oh, God, no, I said. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, no. And he was like, all right. But I guess people forget that they have a bag because, I don't know, they give you painkillers. And they gave me painkillers. So at first it didn't really bug me all that much um, because of the painkillers. They gave me morphine and it was honestly... Morphine was amazing. They made all the pain go away and it made me finally want to re rest and sleep. And so they gave me painkillers. And I guess people forget that they have the bag when they wake up and they have it next to them. And when they try to get up, they put their hand on the bag and then they push up and that whoosh, and they rip out the line. And that scared me so much. I've been super careful. I've been super cautious and where I have my bag because I do not do not want that to happen to me because I do not want that procedure to happen again um I went back they finally took me back to the room it was interesting to say the least going to the restroom because it's not it's not a urinal bag it's not one of those bags that they put where your poo and pee gun comes out it's it's one of those bags where they stick it on the abscess so that it drains the fluids in there before it ruptures again so and then I had a male nurse who would hear me <laughs> at this point honestly all form of embarrassment left because I've already been exposed at this point not like people here let, let, show, let me see, see everything no I, what I mean is that I've already been looked at by a bunch of male doctors, a bunch of nurses, a bunch of female doctors. At this point, all form of embarrassment just left. And I knew they were just there to do their jobs, basically, to help me out. So at one point, I called the nurse because I needed to go restroom because I went restroom a lot, quite a bit. And he was like, well, you don't mind if I help you, right? I'm just like, honestly, at this point, no. <laughs> I just need to go. If you want to help me, you help me. But he ended up staying and some of the nurses will leave the door just a bit crack open or some of them will close the door fully and this nurse left it a little open because they're supposed to see how I'm doing, how I'm doing down there to see if I'm like actually doing my business, how it's supposed to be. And I'm still at this point doing really loose stool and he... I ended up going to the restroom. He left the door a bit open and he stayed in the room. Some nurses leave leave the room and come back within like 10 five minutes even but he stayed in the room and I was very gassy so when I went and I sat down I'm just like 
But honestly, like I said, all form of embarrassment after that just kind of, you know, just went out the door. Um, anyways, finally, after midday, after two or three days of not having really eaten a meal, I finally was put on a clear liquid diet. But I got my first meal and it was amazing. They gave me chicken broth, nothing else, just chicken broth, um, and then juices. So they gave me apple juice, the nurse gave me an, a popsicle, um, water, um, and an unsweetened iced tea. And I drank just about everything. I ate, drank the soup and it was amazing. It was a little bit salty, but since it was my first meal out of the longest time and my appetite was actually there I drank it and it was actually pretty good and then for dinner I got the same thing <laughs> and then for breakfast the next day the same thing <laughs> so I kind of got a little bit tired of it the doctor came talked to me again and then he finally cleared me for full liquids so I was able to get yogurt a little bit of cream or like milk in my my um pastas and my noodles I got a chicken noodle soup for lunch that day but it was puree uh, at the end of the night they gave me an ice cream strawberry ice cream and oh my god it was so good and then the next morning Sunday morning was when I got um discharged from the hospital but in the morning they brought me back breakfast and they brought me a cream of oats that I did not like. It was nasty. It was gross. I tried to eat a little spoonful. I just couldn't do it. And then I got discharged. <laughs> My mom finally arrived from California because she wanted to be with me during this time. And um, they wheelchaired me out. I was finally able to walk around after those many days. Like I didn't really walk all around. I was mostly in bed. Or if not, just going to the restroom. But that was about it. I didn't go take walks. So that kind of weakened my legs, to be honest with you. Even those little days. I can only imagine those people who are there for, for the longest time. And I was only there for a couple of days. And that kind of weakened my legs there. Um, so they wheelchaired me all the way out to the front. And they helped me in my car. They helped me put the seatbelt on. Um, and all this time I'm very aware where my bag is. Okay. I've not forgotten. I'm careful. I'm being very careful. My mom and my sister bought very comfortable clothes. Like I'm wearing them right now, which I'll show you in a bit, but they're so comfortable and they have pockets. So I put, I put the bag in my pocket and, um, we went home. My sister and my mom have been honestly so amazing. They helped organize and and clean my room my sister washed all my blankets and my pillows because when I was sick before I was sent to the hospital all those symptoms I was feeling I was extremely tired a lot like I was so tired I didn't want to do anything and from their perspective I got very lazy okay and I don't blame them honestly my sister would get mad at me because I'll lay around a lot I'll take a lot of naps they didn't know any better and also because of my stubbornness I wouldn't go to the hospital and I would get stuck doing nothing a lot of the times and um, they're very awesome and they help wash all of my clothes that were dirty. My sister washed my um, sheets, my bed sheets, my pillowcases and everything, my blankets and by the time I got home everything was clean and ready for me to use basically and honestly without them I don't know how I would have done it. Um, my mom has helped me with figuring out what kind of foods I can eat and both my mom and my sister have been doing a lot of research on what I've been diagnosed with which is diverticulitis and um it's been an experience to say the least like yesterday I got for the first time a gas attack I ate lunch which was white rice chicken breast cut into very very small because of diverticulitis I can't consume a lot of foods I used to eat and because of that too I need to really chew my food and it was kind of scary because I didn't want to go to the hospital again but like I said if I had to I would have um my mom was like should we take you let's take you and I was just like okay hold on let's wait about an hour or two and if I still I still am feeling it then let's go because I was starting to feel pressure it wasn't much pain but with more pressure towards the lower part of the chest. 
And at first it was small. I wasn't really going to say anything because I was going to be like, okay, well, it's not that big. I'm going to let it pass and and it's going to be good. But then it started, the pressure started growing more and more and I got kind of worried. So I did tell my mom and that's when we got like, you know, a little bit concerned. But then like maybe 30 minutes later, I had to keep going back and forth to the restroom because I really needed to poop. Like I needed to poop a lot during this time. So I'll go back and each time I would go restroom I'd come out and it'd be a little bit of a relief but all, not really all that much and I kept telling my mom I feel like some like like or er, like like I don't know how to explain it but you know how when your stomach rumbles you know they go Rrr. I kept feeling that in my stomach and towards my throat so and it felt like I had it felt okay it felt like you take a giant pill and I'm pretty sure everyone has taken a giant pill at one point But it felt like you take a giant pill and you swallowed it and it went down sideways rather than like the long way easier. And you just feel it go all the way down, right? You feel it go all the way down. But it felt like it got stuck there. And turns out it was gas because 30 minutes later, I did the biggest burp, biggest burp. And oh my God, it was such a relief. Um, I did still feel some pressure, but it was very little and it wasn't like, what I was feeling earlier but throughout the day I kept burping and burping and burping and by the end of the night it was full relief I didn't feel it anymore so that was that was that was an experience too my first gas attack Uh, my brother-in-law actually has a chronic chronic illness too so I was able to and I feel I find that I've been able to ask him a lot of questions and and see how his experience has been and it has been helping me a lot with more information and finding out things and procedures and whatnot and he has been very helpful with that so it's been great like again everyone here has been really helpful and um he explained that he's also had that too and the thing is we feel like it might have been because I kind of overate all these times since the hospital I've been and even since the three weeks I haven't really like overindulged in food anymore because of my lo- my lack of appetite and yesterday and since recently I've been having my appetite come back more and more and I guess yesterday I, I wanted a little bit of a bigger lunch and I ate it all in one sitting and I didn't feel full until I stood up because after I eat I take walks around the living room to help digest the food better and um I stood up and the second I stood up, oh my god, I felt super, super, super bloated in my stomach. Like, I felt super full and bloated. And I told my mom, I was just like, oh my god, I think I did eat too much because it's, I feel full. Like, I feel, and I started, like, touching and it felt hard. Like, I was just like, it feels bloated. And I started take, doing, like, one or two rounds and then I needed to go restroom. So I went restroom and then when I came out, that's when I started feeling the pressure and so I, t- I walked more and more, but the more I walked, the more I started feeling. So there was all of that. And I kept going back and forth to the restroom. And then we we um, we read that if it came with other symptoms, that's when it's to be concerned about and go to the ER. But since it was just that, we kind of waited it out. But yeah, I drank a lot of water, apple juice, and that did help with with bringing it out. So I know now that if I feel it again, drink lots of water walk around more because the exercise help with moving things along and the water helps with filling up the empty gas space that's in you and pushing it back out so that's what happened and then today I've been a lot gassy too so burp 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 fart 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 (laughs) um but I've been more careful with what I'm eating um portion sizes um and we're testing something out so I ate breakfast I ate pancakes which is soft which is delicious, gluten-free, obviously, because diverticulitis and PCOS requires me to be gluten-free. I took my walks, I drank orange juice with that, and I had lunch, which I'm going to show you guys in another video. But basically what it was was jello, pudding, and a fruit cup. And I had lunch. So the new day diet we're changing is that instead of having like a full-on meal, which was like a tuna sandwich, or a chicken bowl with rice, or soup or something like that we kind of just stuck to snacks to see how it goes because honestly that experience with the gas attack wasn't really the funnest experience I'm gonna be honest so like I mean if I can avoid it great if it happens I think I know what to do now 
The doctor put me on a soft diet, soft food diet. So everything I eat has to be really soft. And I can't eat a lot of things until I basically have my a surgery because I'm going to have surgery eventually. I'm going to have a colonoscopy to make sure I don't have colon cancer. And to basically to figure out how how everything is looking in there. And then from there, I'm going to have surgery and basically to re- to fix my colon because where the abscess was had rotten, basically, because it ruptured. So it's basically rotten and it's bad. It's a bad piece. So before it can happen again, the doctor mentioned a few things that, that scared me, honestly. Because if I don't get the surgery, there might be a chance that it happens again. And this time I don't make it in time because this time... I was able to make it in time to the hospital and my body was able to fight it off long enough basically for them to be able to help me. Um, But they're concerned that they can't promise that they can help me now and it won't happen again because a lot of people with diverticulitis tend to get more abscess and they don't want it to be where I get a second one and I don't make it in time to the hospital. So... I'm going to have surgery. They're going to remove that bad part and they're going to, so they're going to take it out and then they're going to reattach the good healthy parts together. That's going to be more, hopefully not too long from now, but it's probably not going to be to like another month or two, probably three. We'll see. I still haven't really heard much from the surgeon just yet, but that's because they want to wait for my abscess inside to fully drain and heal before they can see about surgery and the colonoscopy um there's been a lot of things i haven't been able to eat because of that i can't eat skins on things so like grapes if i want to eat grapes i have to make sure i peel the skins i have to make sure i cannot eat any seeds i can't eat strawberries right now i can't eat any anything with seeds and i if i am like bell peppers if i want to eat bell peppers i'd have to really roast the bell peppers peel the skin and make sure i de-seed everything that's the only way i can eat bell peppers and much other fruits, honestly, vegetables and fruits. I can't really eat skins and seeds. I can't eat nuts at the moment, popcorn, you know, peanuts, almonds, um, sesame seeds type of thing. Um, basically anything that can get caught in those other little pockets that I do still have in my colon, which is why it's diverticulitis, is that you get pockets all over your, your colon and with bad bathroom habits, It causes them little things to stick in there and then it starts expanding with all these other bad fluids and liquids and that's how it gets infection and that's how you create an abscess and that's how it's able to be ruptured if it's too much. So I'm not able to eat a lot of foods. I have lost a lot of weight, okay, quite a bit. Something I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life and it's something that I'm going to have to figure out. And again, like I've mentioned, I've have I have people around me, and I'm very lucky that I have these people around me to help me figure everything out. And it's gonna be a battle with food with me because I might have the surgery right after, and it is gonna help me a lot to remove that bad part of the colon. But I do still have diverticulitis, and it's gonna it's gonna be where I'm gonna have to figure out what foods I can eat and what foods I can't. And if there's a food that I can't eat and does not sit well with me, then my body's going to react and I might get an abscess again or I might get an infl- inflammation again or I might start feeling sick again. Or I can eat foods that I find work well with me and then I'm perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, um, that's what's going on. Um, I have lost a lot of weight. i am be honest, like I had gained a lot of weight throughout the years, like my diet has changed drastically like honestly the second I walked into that ER room last week and a half my life changed like from my life changed and it's it's a journey like it's 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 difficult I'm not gonna lie because just because my life changed doesn't mean everyone else's life has to change my sister obviously is not gonna eat what I have to eat. My brother-in-law is gonna, not going to eat what I have to eat. They're not going to be like, oh, okay, since Esther can't eat these, we're not going to eat it. They're going to obviously eat it. They're going to enjoy their food. They're going to eat what they're supposed. They're, they're going to want to eat. I'm going to 
have all that willpower. Sometimes I underestimate myself and sometimes I feel like I'm going to, I'm going to go into the kitchen one night and I'm going to eat something I'm not supposed to eat, but I don't, I don't. And I do have that willpower. I know I do because up to this point, I haven't had any, um, any moments where I, I sneak something in because it's a scary thing, honestly, when the doctor told me that it could happen again and this time I might not make it in time to the hospital, it is a scary thing to hear. So because of that, I feel like it's one of the main reasons why I haven't um, snuck anything in. But yes, it does still look appetizing. It does smell really good, especially with my appetite coming back. Everything looks amazing. At the moment, I have to eat cooked foods because it has to be all soft. I can't eat hard because I need my stomach. I need to give it a break from digestion. So because of my bag, because I still have my catheter bag on in me, it has to be easy foods going through. So it goes through fairly easy and my stomach and my body doesn't work that bad for much. That being said, I'm going to show you guys my catheter bag. <laughs> if you guys do not want to see it, you guys can fast forward. You guys can get out of the video. But I want to show you guys my catheter bag. One, two, three. Here it comes out the catheter bag. It gets drained, but the liquid is there. This is not good liquid. This is infected liquid. And this is the thing that should be coming out of you if you have a catheter bag. This is where we drain it out from. And this is where it comes out from. Right now, it looks a little bit dry. That's because of the way I have it and whatnot and then it comes down here I'll show it in a bit it comes down here and it connects to um, a patch it connects it's a little hole like right over here and the line comes out so I'm gonna try to do this without really exposing because it's really low so right here it's the thing where I'm supposed to disconnect because I'm supposed to flush and actually looking at the time, I need a flush right now. I need a flush three times a day. It's 6.30, at 6 30 in the morning, 2 30 p.m. and at 10 30 p.m. So I'm gonna see if I can without really exposing all that much. This is it, the the line I'm supposed to flush. And why don't I flush it on screen so you guys can see it? So this is a line I need to drain through. Okay. We unplug this loop we attach the syringe is already pre-filled you're supposed to input the liquid and then pull it out and get anything that might be clogging the lines um all of last week was obviously nasty and recently the last couple of days it's been coming out fairly clean like there has been a couple things in there but it's been coming out fairly clean so i don't think it's gonna be that disgusting i need to put my gloves on because since it is an infection liquid it stinks and if you get it on your skin it is nasty and then I'm gonna use a piece of napkin to put right below it okay we have the syringe they keep them closed so that more less susceptible to getting you know contaminated I got my gloves they do not provide gloves you buy those yourself. Okay. And I have another piece of napkin here because I take out the air bubble before I start putting it in. And sometimes the liquid shoots out more than it really should. So, And the first week, I was supposed to put all 10 milliliters. But since my abscess is smaller and to keep it from keeping it open and expanded, I'm only doing five milliliters now. So I hit the syringe. A lot of the times there's air bubbles stuck in the very bottom. So you just boop, 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 boop. All right. Looks good. I'm gonna take out the air. We'll do it over here because it drips. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna hold this. I'm gonna disconnect that just like that. See, that thing's dirty. 
this thing is dirty. That's why I have the thing, because occasionally, like that, it drips. I'm going to take that out. Clean that part just a bit. Okay, you want to hold this, because if you leave it, if you leave it hanging, it's going to drip. And then, you're going to screw it in. Okay, I screwed in. I can see the numbers. And I'm just going to push this until I reach 5 milliliters. And yes, I can feel it. It feels weird. Sometimes it hurts, sometimes it doesn't. For the most part, it feels like I'm urinating myself. I'm not going to lie. Okay, I'm at 5 milliliters. Now I'm going to pull the syringe back until I get resistance. And that part hurts. And actually, that looks like that's the resistance. So I didn't really get much. I got one, one milliliter on the half back. Sometimes you won't get anything back. And sometimes you'll get the whole liquid back. Sometimes you'll get half the liquid back. It all depends. So it looks like I didn't really get much back this time. I'm going to screw this back in. Somewhat tight, not too tight, because then it gets really hard to re-unscrew that. Okay, so there we go. I'm going to close it off with the lid it comes with. Because I don't want it spilling. And I like to check it out to see how it looks. So as you notice, it's not as clear. And I do see a chunk in there, like a little pieces in there. So I do know I'm clearing out the line. Um... I used to go really slow, but then I since learned, my sister is very knowledgeable with a lot of these things, but I since learned if you go really slow, it's going to create a lot of air bubbles because when I would pull it out really slow, I'd get a lot of air coming in through and it was painful. So it does feel weird, but you just go a little bit faster, you pull out a little bit faster and it actually cleans it out. So there that is what I like to do. You see liquid there. Okay. What I like to do is just resituate that back in there. And just recover that. And then with my gloves, I still don't feel bruised up from where they put the IV line in here. And not so much here, but occasionally I'll feel something. Okay. So what I like to do is one of the gloves... I'll stick this in through the, the middle finger. Okay. I'll stick in these napkins in there because they're yucky now. I'll stick in the trash. I'll stick in my other glove. Boom. And then I'll tie it. But um, it's secured in here, and then I throw it into a plastic trash bag. So that's how I flush. Um, like I said last week, the syringe was really nasty, and the color will be either sometimes poopy looking or yellow. So that's why I'm showing you guys now because it's coming out more clear. So that's a good sign, hopefully. Um, if not, I have another. I already had one checkup last week, last Friday, and I have another checkup again this Friday because I had to have it another weekend. And then they'll decide whether I have to have it in longer or they can take it out. So we'll, we'll see, basically. Um, fingers crossed. I'm going to show you guys my walking progress. You're like walking. Yes, nothing really happened to my legs, okay, but... Again, like I said, being in the hospital and laying down and just going back and forth to the restroom. The restroom was pretty, fairly close, so it wasn't that much of a walk anyways. Um, it kind of weakened my leg muscles. And where the catheter bag is placed, even the radiologist was like, yeah, it's going to be placed really low than most people typically get a catheter bag in. So where it's placed and positioned, it felt weird to walk at first. And occasionally it does still feel weird. My sister drives sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes she goes over bumps a little bit too quickly. 
And I'm just like, don't forget, I have a tube in me. It feels weird. But of course, it's going to feel weird. Of course, I'm going to feel sometimes a little bit agitated because it's a it's a it's a foreign object in my body. And my body's going to be like, what is this? And, you know, they're going to try to do things and whatnot. But it's for my own health. It's for my own good. Um and hopefully by next week which is for me it's going to be in a couple of days probably you guys will see it maybe after I get it removed or something or maybe I'll edit the video much sooner and get it out much sooner so we'll see because I have a lot of time at the moment I do take lots of walks to help with my walking um, and I have gotten a lot better and a lot faster and I walk a lot normal now because before I walked more like a penguin (laughs) and um I don't get that sensation as much often on my my legs where I would like feel like I was gonna get cramps a lot. Um, I don't get them as much, but I do get some feelings here and there. It's all happened very quickly, like I've mentioned, and a lot of scary things were told to me. And obviously, that makes someone feel a certain way, you know. Like I know some of you guys can relate. I after having my experience, I heard some of your guys' experience, and it that it did help me too. Like better like not because oh you guys went through it too you know not 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 because of that but because you guys went through it and I know it's not just it's not just me you know it's not just I'm not gonna lie yes I'm just occasionally like why me why did this have to happen to me there's other people out there that I've seen even worse than I do or 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 even worse than I am and they're perfectly healthy and then here I am like I want to enjoy life a little bit and you know it happens but I know there's no, there's no right for me to complain because I know there's people out there who have it way worse than I do and um but it is gonna be a process for me to be able to get that fully into my head because I'm I still feel that way sometimes and there's doctor said even that with with finding out these types of things people do get depression people do get anxiety they get um they get scared basically because it's gone we've experienced it once and we don't want to experience it again so you develop you develop these new fears these new anxieties like sometimes I get a little bit scared to eat certain foods because I'm I don't know how it's gonna react sometimes I'm a little bit scared to lay down a certain position because I don't know if my tube's gonna come out <laughs> <clears throat> I get a lot of anxiety with my little nephew and I don't blame him. He's only three years old. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know any better. He doesn't know that I'm injured down here. I have a hole here. And if he plays rough with me, this thing can potentially be dislodged from where it is or pulled out. And he's already run into me twice here and it did hurt. I'm not going to lie. It hurt. But that wasn't my first week even too. So it was more sensitive. Um, Now that I'm, it's, I'm getting used to it now, right? Um, I'm I'm practicing more to do my day-to-day life. Like today, we practiced driving. It was a little bit uncomfortable with pressing the brake, but um, if I press it early on enough, um, it doesn't feel all that bad. Um, yeah, doing day-to-day things. So going back to that, getting back to that, and... Now that I'm feeling much better, I'm going to be more up to recording again and releasing more videos. But this time it's going to be more on, on, it's going to be different because I cannot eat the things I used to eat. I cannot show you guys my binge eating days. I can't to be like, oh, today I'm going to try out this or tomorrow I'm going to try out this. I know I made a video already about my first chronic illness which is PCOS, it's for women, um, and then here I am again, hey guys, I have a second chronic illness, and I don't want, like, be like, oh, you know, I have two chronic illnesses, how unlucky of me, because I know there's people who have it worse, you know, there are other people who have more chronic illnesses possibly than I do, and I know there's someone out there who also has PCOS and diverticulitis, and the thing is, the diets with PCOS and diverticulitis a lot of it match, but sometimes they don't. And it's going to be a difficult thing to figure out because some things I'll be able to eat with diverticulitis, I can't eat with PCOS. And a lot of things I need to eat with PCOS, I can't eat with diverticulitis. Cause for example, PCOS, it's very, the nuts are very good. 
but I can't eat that with diverticulitis. Diverticulitis, nuts is one of the main ingredients that cause flare-ups again and those symptoms. So it's going to be like, again, a battle with me with food, but it's something I'm going to have to figure out and I'm going to put out there to help other people, excuse me, be able to figure it out too. Um, all right. I think I'm going to end it here. I feel like I've ranted on and on it's been over an hour already since I've been talking and showing you guys things and telling you guys things if I can say anything to all of my friends and family make better choices you know food choices I never I never once in my life would think that I would get something like this okay like I've heard people and I'm just be like that's that kind of sucks but I never would think oh that can possibly happen to me and I don't know why it can happen to anyone it really can but I never thought of it that way that it can happen to me so I just kept enjoying food I just kept making the worst choices for me and I wish it would have I would have done things differently and I wish I would have I wish I would have not done a couple things you know but um you know things go the way they do and things happen the way they happen and um un now my life has changed and it's going to it's going to be it's going to be an experience so yeah all right then you guys have a good day good night if you guys have any questions obviously put them in the comments and i'll try to answer them to the best of my knowledge but again this is new to me still too so I probably won't even have all the answers, you know. All right, then, guys. I'll see you guys in the next video.